Michael Popak, and look at that setting sun. It must be time for Legal AF After Dark. On a recent edition, we sat down and dissected what happened in Georgia. Is Donald Trump going to end up going to trial in 2024, even 2025? What is the intermediary appellate court in Georgia doing with Fawny Willis's motion to dismiss the appeal, seeking to have her removed from the prosecution of Donald Trump? And what are they doing with the overall appeal that Donald Trump had of the trial judge's decision not to disqualify Fawny Willis? It's all one big mess that we try to unpack and explain the only way we know how on Legal AF. Take a listen. Why don't you, since you're steeped in it, why don't you talk about uh, what's going on in Georgia with the appeal? Because there's been a new development there, and I think you're the right person to kind of catch our audience up on it. Yeah, so um, so oral argument date has been set for uh, December 5th at the um, Georgia Appellate Court for to um, determine whether or not Fonnie Willis can continue to prosecute that case. If you remember that this was a, uh, a case where, um, where some of the defendants said that she had an affair and therefore she should be disqualified. And then they had this hearing to see whether there was a conflict of interest because she was having a consensual adult relationship with the lead prosecutor, Nathan Wade, who she brought in to prosecute that case. He's a former judge. He's a former um, uh, prosecutor and he's a well-respected attorney in that community. She brought him in after several other people, including the former governor of Georgia who turned her down to be the lead lawyer on that case. So she brings him in. Um, she and he then had a consensual adult sexual relationship apparently and um, and as a result the there was this long involved hearing saying that was a conflict of interest now many of us including me uh, watched that entire hearing to really try to see what the conflict of interest was and whether there was a conflict of interest and certainly I didn't see any evidence whatsoever come out that there was a conflict of interest. And in fact, Judge McAfee did not find that there was an actual conflict of interest. What he did say, however, is that there was an appearance of impropriety, an appearance of a conflict. Now, I still disagree. I don't understand it. It's not like she, it's not like she was having an affair with someone on the other side of the V, you know, the the um, Georgia versus Trump, you know, it's not like one of the defense attorneys. It's not like she was having an affair with the judge. I mean, you know, it's an HR question mark, whether or not that's appropriate. But what what's the conflict? It was unclear. It was never clear. Uh, people speculated that it was financial, but they never really kind of developed that at the hearing. So I was surprised that he would even say there was an appearance of impropriety um, or an appearance of a conflict. But he did, but he said it would be remedied if um, Mr. Wade were to get off the case, which he promptly did. He uh, resigned, and but Judge McAfee allowed um, allowed the uh, defense to appeal, which they did, and they briefed it or they're briefing it now. Oral arguments is set for after the election, um, so at the time they'll know whether or not that uh, that he's going to be president or not. Um, so that you know, this, the, the, there's a lot of moving parts to this case, right? This case is very much tied to the DC case, the Tanya Chutkin case, in the sense that a lot of the evidence is the same, a lot of the charges are similar, um, and uh, a lot of the conduct is similar. This continues and does a lot more on Georgia and um, obviously has 17 more defendants than that case. But the reason it's significant is this July 1st presidential immunity decision. So let's just start with, can Fonnie Willis prosecute the case? That's what's going to be decided. If she gets removed from the case, frankly, I think the case is, is you know, I don't know who they would put in to do it or who could do it. So the case is a, a big question mark then. But let's say she can stay on the case. The next thing that has to happen, first of all, Donald Trump is going to be president. There is absolutely no way uh, that case will go against him during um, his presidency. And the reason is federal law 
um, through a memo from the Office of Legal Counsel interpreting the United States Constitution, has determined that a sitting president cannot be prosecuted while they are president. That that just cannot happen because it interferes with his ability to run the country. So because of the United States um, Constitution's supremacy clause, which uh, I think it's um, Article 6, uh, clause two says um, uh, basically that um, the law, the supreme law of the land is federal and takes precedent over any conflicting state law. So even if Georgia state law said you could prosecute a sitting president because that's federal law, that would control. So Trump, if he wins, will not go to trial while he is president, number one. She could proceed against the other defendants, however. But there'll still have to be an analysis about the evidence and about the charges and immunity, again, because of the supremacy clause, right? The Supreme Court now has has determined that he's immune as to certain, certain things. Um, so a lot of that, what's in that indictment, I think would come out. Um, the, the, the candidate Trump stuff, right? The find 11,000, 780 votes, the perfect famous phone call, I think actually will survive. Um, and I think the Georgia specific stuff uh, is more candidate Trump. So it's not President Trump it will not be his official acts. But your guess is as good as mine of what will happen. But but that case as to Trump is very much in question as to whether or not that will go at all, or certainly will go anytime in the next four and a half to five years. Um, and, and what survives with the other defendants. Um, I do think that could go though, whether or not he's president, but, but that's, that's what I think. Yeah. I think, I think you're right. Her, she, uh, so Fonnie Wells has a motion to dismiss the appeal that I assume will now be heard after the election. She, her, her grounds for that, which I covered once before is that there is, there is no ability to appeal the fact finding that is at the heart of the, a decision by Judge McAfee, and once you rip that away from the appeal, there's nothing else to do. Um, there's so much deference is given to the trier of fact in this area, and that's what they're they're just trying to do. They're trying to make the appellate court redo the the factual hearing or uh, or um, interpret the facts differently, and that's not their job. And she pointed that out. But rather than hear that early, they're hearing that I assume closer in time or at the day of the oral argument, whenever that is set. And as you said, it's only the second, the first level appeal. There's, level also, appeal. there's also a Georgia appellate court, uh, the Supreme Court of Georgia that would have to get involved as well. But then you have the the heart of the matter is the heart of the case being ripped out by the immunity decision. Uh, we've always said that, yes, state prosecutions are great when it comes to Donald Trump, if they're successful because they can't be pardoned away as easily. Um, it depends on your state and your governor or your parole board, probation board, whatever it is um, in your particular place. But but the Supreme Court has just given a blanket, almost absolute immunity um, or immunity that's very difficult to overcome for official conduct. And the, the, they would require, uh, and it's now the law of the land, and they would require, and any judge in Georgia will have to follow the Supreme Court on this issue. They're not going to be able to come up with their own aversions that many of the things in the allegate in the uh, speaking indictment, the sprawling indictment that Fonnie Willis chose to use, and we applauded her for it at the time, are going to be they have to be sifted out and surgically removed from the from the indictment because they're not going to be able to to support um, the charges because of the official conduct and official conduct can't be used as evidence to help you prove unofficial conduct. So she's got a bit of a problem if she even gets the case back about what her indictment looks like versus what the Supreme Court, US Supreme Court decision is. And then you've got the whole kick it down the road, kick the can by these three judges on this panel outside of Atlanta to like, these these are people who didn't want the political calendar to be involved. They were like, yeah, we're, we're except in to favor of the candidate, let's kick it way out there. Now, the one of the things that I've, I've called for, and we'll talk about it at probably another hot take or um, as this thing develops, is the thing that's missing, as you as you said, is the other co-conspirators, they're not out of the woods. Uh, the immunity decision doesn't help them. They, at, at worst or best, they conspired to commit crimes with somebody that had immunity. <laughs> that doesn't help them. Um, and I would assume, based on her track record and her approach, that she's going to prosecute the case against the other 14 or 15 
regardless, many of those people that are in there, think about this. If Donald Trump somehow gets restored to power, there's no other way to put this. Um, many of these people that have been indicted or unindicted, unindicted co-conspirators, cooperators, they can all be swept back with him. People have to recognize that his coattails are loaded with felons, people in and out of prison, people who lost their law licenses or should, and co-conspirators, including ones charged around the country in the attorney general cases. And I've said, and I called for this in a recent hot take, we we should demand, and Joe Biden should demand, that Donald Trump put up his cabinet. Tell us who is going to be in his West Wing. Who's your attorney general? Who's your secretary of state? Who's in this office? Who's who's your chief of staff? I mean, you know, a lot of times in order to make a a a, a country feel better, or at least know what they're voting for, a a presidential candidate will be pictured their cabinet are right around the time of the convention. You know Donald Trump's not going to do that because he doesn't want people to know, especially the independents and those that are still on the fence about his candidacy, about the criminal element that he's going to sweep back into the into the White House with them. And some of those people are in the Georgia prosecution. You don't think Mike Roman, who was the head of his election day operations, who was the mule to carry the fake elector certificates, you don't think he's going to be back in a White House with Donald Trump, even though he's indicted in Georgia? Donald Trump doesn't care about that. He's putting on the stage today or tomorrow, Peter Navarro. Peter Navarro just got sprung from the Miami Penitentiary today. He's in, he's changing out of his orange and he's changing into some suit and they're throwing him up on the stage to be celebrated and feted because that's what the restoration of Donald Trump's presidency sort of means. Well, welcome back. That was Legal AF, a podcast on the Midas Touch Network. We do it on Wednesdays and Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. Wednesdays, I do it with Karen Freeman at Niffalo. Saturdays with my co-founder, Ben Mycellus. And then on hot takes like this one, about every hour, we sit at the intersection of law and politics so that you don't have to. And we curate in a long format podcast, the top three or four stories at that intersection of law and politics. Pick it up here. Free subscribe on this YouTube channel. You knew that already. You're here. Or pick it up on audio podcast platforms of your choice. And then if you know everything you need to know about Legal AF, you're already part of our audience. That's growing. We appreciate it. We're growing by word of mouth and organically. That's the only way we can grow. Thank you for being here. Let's try to get a few more people in your life to join the Legal AF movement. Send that clip off if you can to people in your life and tell them here's a little mini Legal AF episode and maybe that'll encourage them to join. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I invite you to join us and find out why we call it Legal AF Wednesday, Saturdays at 8 p.m. Eastern time on this Midas Touch YouTube channel and on audio podcast platforms. Until my next hot take, until my next Legal AF, this is Michael Popak reporting. Heary, heary, Legal AF Law Breakdown is now in session. Go beyond the headlines and get a deep dive into the important legal concepts you need to know and we discuss every day on Legal AF. Exclusive content you won't find anywhere else, all for the price of a couple of cups of coffee. Join us at patreon.com slash legal AF. That's patreon.com slash legal AF.